You're listening to Combat Radio with Ethan Dettenmeyer, right here on L.A. Talk Radio. Um, we're getting ready to make a phone call to somebody who's actually been very instrumental to some of the landmark movies of the past. He has been Stanley Kubrick's right-hand man for over 30 years up until, obviously, Stanley passed. He now ran, runs the uh, Stanley Kubrick archives over at Warner Brothers. He was one of the producers on the Academy Award-nominated Little Children. Uh, he cast the little boy in The Shining, and he's an all-around exciting guy to talk to, and we're going to call him up right now. Hello? Hi, Leon. Yeah. It's Ethan here with Combat Radio. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm excited to talk to you. Okay. I, I've got Lota Hadley here. Hi, Leon. How are you? I'm fine. How are you, Lota? Hi. I know you guys have been talking a lot recently to make this happen, and we actually, before we uh, jumped on the phone with you, Leon, you're live, by the way. Um, right. We uh, we were talking a little bit about your ever impressive resume, but I left out some of the highlights because I think we'll want to get to that in a conversational point. But I had talked about your sure. your history with Stanley Kubrick and how uh, many of our audiences, uh, many people in our audience, actually think that you are the reason he had all that success. That it had nothing to do with him. That it was actually you. Who, <laughs> That's so right. <laughs> that you had to pull Stanley aside and say, Stanley. Um, we really need a we really need a big wheel shot in this in this in this movie somewhere. It's a big hotel. We need a big wheel shot. <laughs> Loda was telling me, um, uh, and I hope you don't mind if I just jump right to this. But Loda was telling me that you sure. you were well. I guess let's start here. This would be probably a, the better place for me. How did you meet Kubrick, and how did you come to work with him for so long? Because he trusted you for so long on so many things. Well. Um... I used to, I, I was an actor. Uh, I went to drama school and was uh, trained as an actor in, in London. And um, I just went to an audition uh, for Barry Lyndon. I'd, I'd actually, it was strange because I'd just left drama school when I saw 2001, and I was just totally so impressed with it and blown away. And, um, you know, what impressed me most was that you know, here was a film, and for the first twenty minutes, there hadn't been a word of dialogue. But you know, you were following a story, and it was so you know wonderfully told and beautifully photographed, of course. And then after that, uh, while I was actually working as an actor, I saw the uh, Clockwork Orange, and it just absolutely appealed to me in such a huge way because at drama school, you know, you're kind of taught. Well, in my drama school, anyway, we, we worked a lot with improvisation, a lot, and um, also, you know, how to find a character through improvisation. And it seemed to me all the performances were so broad, so big, you know, and I just loved that. It seemed such a hybrid between film and, and theater, uh, somehow. And I just turned to the person who, who I was watching the film with, and, and I just said, I just got to work for that person. And while I was uh, on a, another, another film uh, somewhere in Ireland, actually, um, I heard about auditions for Barry Lyndon. And so my agent you know, sent in my CV and my photograph, and I went for an audition, thinking that it was like every audition that was ever held in England at that time for film, where you sit down with a producer and a director, maybe, and, um, you know, you look at, they look at your photograph and they say, yes or no or maybe on the spot but it wasn't like that it was the first time um, I'd ever done a video audition you've got to remember this is like 1973 you know it was real to real video in those days so it was very you know very primitive but he he was using them and I didn't get to meet Stan I did two auditions on video I didn't actually get to meet Stan until I went down uh, to the location, which was in Salisbury in England. And uh, he just tapped me on the arm when I was hanging around in the hotel, you know, wondering what was going on, and just introduced himself very quietly. You know, hi, Leon. Yeah, I'm Stanley. And it was just like that. And we started talking, and that's how I met him. And it was another two months before I actually got on set to shoot anything. Um, and he had a peculiar way of working in that way because he had me cold and full makeup and costume and, and everything, you know. But I would just sit outside the set and just stew, basically. And, uh, yeah, so it was 
two months before we actually met on the set. Now, how long was that shoot? Because that is a long, that's an epic movie. Well, um, they started shooting in, uh, I think, in the late summer in Ireland. Um, and I was waiting and waiting and waiting for the call because everyone assumed that the whole thing was going to be shot in Ireland, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it, it just went on and on and on. And it was only in uh, the end of January that I finally got a, a call. And then I found out subsequently that they'd left Ireland and the, you know, ostensible reason for leaving Ireland was because the safe and the production office had been blown and they'd been given uh, a warning letter by the IRA that they had to get out of Ireland. <laughs> and so that was, you know, basically the reason why they shifted and moved location back to England. Well, you've got to appreciate the IRA's agenda at the time to say, we're going to make a statement by forcing the Stanley Kubrick production off of our island. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm sure they, they made hay with that one. I uh, really do. But I, I had a contract. My contract originally, you see, was for, um, it was for 13 shooting days over eight weeks. And so when I went down in January, I only thought I'd be there till March. But in the end, I was there till the end of August. And, you know, I only had one big scene and a couple of small scenes to establish character. When I first went down there, by the time we'd finished, he'd written a whole bunch of scenes for me and just kept me there till the end of the movie. And if our audience is wondering, those who've seen the movie, uh, uh, Leon wraps it up by blasting Ryan O'Neill in the leg, which is later amputated because of the shot. Amputated, yes. Way to get it done. Way to get it done. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you, uh, so that's really where you started. Because when I first met you the first time, I was struck by how young you were to have such a history with such a prolific filmmaker, and uh, that mm-hmm. now, now it makes perfect sense. And at, at that point, I guess after Barry Lyndon, uh, Stanley says, "You know, I like this guy. This guy's agreeable and he's smart. Maybe I should hire him." Is that how it went down, or did he? How did it work? Well, I, I, I think you know, with Stanley, everything happens uh, happened on an emotional level. I mean, you know, uh, he he was a complicated guy, as I'm sure you, you can understand. But, you know, he, he he would allow me to come on the set and just watch what was going on, which may not sound much, but when you realize that Stanley was the kind of person, if you had no business on the set, no work on the set, everyone would stay away. And that included, you know, Warner Brothers executives and, and, and people on his own staff. So, you know, it was incredibly illuminating just to sit in a set. And, I, you know, he allowed me to, I could ask him anything I wanted. I mean, I could ask him about why he was doing a particular lighting setup. And I just got so interested in it. And by the end of the production, you know, I was telling him that, you know, I was kind of getting more interested in how you make the pictures than actually being in them. And uh, that's what he remembered. And so when he was going into production for The Shining, um, I, I was living in Stockholm in Sweden at that time. And uh, um, I just got a book through the post, just a little brief note saying, read this. And so I read it. And two days later, he called me and it was The Shining. And he said, would you like to work on this? And I said, yes, I would. And that's how it really sort of kicked. And that's when I really started working for him you know, on the production side. I was going to say, uh, one of my all-time favorite actors is in Barry Lyndon, and I hope you're not going to tell me he was a prick, but if you do, I guess it's okay, because his career is pretty much into retirement, <laughs> which is uh, Hardy, yeah. Kr- Hardy Kruger. Uh, Hardy Kruger. Now, I I only met Hardy Kruger sort of socially while he, he came in to uh, shoot a scene. It was a scene where, um, you know, he's flattened under the, the beam when you're, they're fighting a battle. He was actually a very, very nice man, I found. Yeah. You speak as you find. I, I never found him <laughs> anything but, you know, a really nice man, an interesting man, and, a, you know, as you'd expect, a pretty erudite kind of guy. Yeah, you know, it's funny. You know, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Leon. No, 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 no. Go on. No, I was going to say, I, I actually, for a movie I had written and was producing a couple years back, tried to uh, hire him, and I contacted his Los Angeles-based representation, and the manager goes, you know, I haven't spoken to Hardy in years. Like he just yeah, kind of, huh? like, like he just kind of wandered off into the sunset, you know. But he was, he was. I remember watching Barry Lyndon say, "Man, this is one of my favorite." But prior to Barry Lyndon, but you know, this this movie alone, just oh, because it has Kruger in it, was great. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He, you know, I kind of think he, he belonged to a kind of generation of of uh, European actors like Max von Sydow. They're, they're kind of the same time frame, you know, where the work they've done, and, and you know, which is encompass stage and and film equally. You know, they just they just have a strength that, that they don't have to cook anything. They're just there, and you know, they're one they're wonderful people to look at. Let alone you know their acting abilities. But you know, they just have a they just have some kind of thing about them uh, that makes them strong, appear strong on screen. But he must be he must be he must have been quite old by the time he got to it. I would have thought. Yeah, he might have been. I don't know. You know, I mean, I seem to remember so many strong performances for, of his in the, in that time period, like from seventy five to basically eighty two. But uh, but it's not right. it's not about uh, it's not about Hardy until he he calls me back. Um, it's it's a uh, it's more about you and your work. Uh, um, you know, and one of the things you were you you said you got the book The Shining in the mail. Uh, yeah, and yeah. He, he said, "Would you like to work on this?" And of course, you probably didn't need long to think about that. No. But at, at the time, he obviously didn't, he didn't put in the note though that we would all be that you would all be stuck in a snowstorm up in uh, you know the Rockies for several months together, did he? Or what were the? Well, no, no, no. no. What he what he wanted me to do? Uh, he just the first thing he asked me was you know what do you think of it? And I said well you know it's a great story it really was. And so he said well you know what the biggest task is is going to be to find the little boy. So what I want you to do is to go to, uh, you know, the States and to find a little boy. And um, so they set up a whole sort of network inside uh, Colorado and Kansas and Illinois. So I, was, I went to Denver and Chicago and Kansas City. And over a period of six months, I saw 4,000 little boys for that role. I mean, incredible number of of children that came from everywhere, I can't tell you. Mm -hmm. And I know that he was holding sort of parallel auditions here in Hollywood at the same time, you know, looking for him. But I found this little boy in Chicago, and his name was Danny Lloyd. And uh, and I, the reason why Stanley wanted me to do that was because we wanted to find, he wanted me to work with them, you know, uh, kind of improvise, in, in, improvise sort of scene set up. So, I would talk to them on camera and interview them on camera, see how comfortable they were on their own. And then if they looked like there was a possibility, I'd get them back and do half-hour improvisation sessions with them using, you know, situations from the actual script and just see how they shaped up that way. And, um, and Danny Lloyd was the guy who, you know, we found. I found him quite early on, actually, but... We were always looking for a backup in case anything went wrong, because Danny was only well, he was just four years old when I met him. What uh, you know. what's that guy doing now? He's a teacher. Yeah, that's what I apparently. Heard. I hadn't spoken to them in years. We had an email contact, sort of flurry of them, uh, a few years ago. But he, he was uh, he's a teacher, and I, I'm not sure where he is now. But he's very happy as a teacher too, right, <laughs> apparently. Right, right. Well, that must have been a fantastic uh, movie to work on. I mean, I can't imagine uh, what it was like wow. working with that cast, especially because Nicholson has the reputation he yeah. does. Did you like working with him? Was he easy to work with? Oh, yeah. And, and the crew loved him. The crew absolutely loved him. Uh, you know, he was just one of those guys who kind of, you know, I think everyone felt like, you know, he didn't think of himself as anything, you know, more important that he knew he had a talent, but, you know, that was it. It wasn't that he elevated himself above anybody else. He didn't He didn't feel the need to sort of uh, be addressed in any particular way other than Jack. And uh, and that's what people liked about him. He really, and, and he was so adaptable and amenable to, you know, the way Stanley was working, because Stanley worked in a rather particular way. You know, it wasn't two takes and done. It was sometimes multi, multi, multi takes and uh, and all day on a scene and someday not even turning over, you know, because we couldn't get the lighting right or something. Just this forbearance that he had for it all, it was just terrific. And, and Stanley really appreciated it, of course. You know, I have to tell you, um, just as a 
you know, doing over the course of doing some research on that movie some time back, I was watching some behind the scenes footage that was shot, I guess, by Stanley's daughter at the time. That's right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. You just see him just like barking at Duvall saying it's, you know, it's 20 below out here. Get back on your mark. You know? <laughs> just like that kind of, like, you know, volatile, of, you know, sort of, uh, I guess, direction that directors sometimes give when all the elements are bearing. Well, down. Well, <laughs> I can tell you about that because I was inside that uh, when that whole incident occurred. And, um, you know, it was just a complete jumble of mixed messages coming, you know, down from like Chinese whispers. You know, by the time it reached her and the cue to go out of the door, it was coming on, it was coming, wait, 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 you know, from a, like a false person in the chain. And it wasn't at all what Stanley was, you know, telling her to do. In the end, as you see from that that, that scene where he's screaming at her, I felt so bad for her. I mean, <laughs> she really <laughs> didn't kind of warrant that because it wasn't her fault. It really wasn't. Well, the things an actress you know? goes through, uh, things the things the actress goes through on behalf of a performance, right? I, uh, and yes, I, I think Shelley said it when she said, you know, uh, she understood it was a, a means to an end, but she wouldn't want to go through it again. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. I understand that because it's very hard for six months, you know. She had to run around and, and be in this constant state of anxiety and hypertension, you know. Uh, it's, it's a long haul. It really is to stay in that state. And Jack gets to say, hey, most of my scenes are downstairs in the bar. You get to run through the building screaming bloody murder. <laughs> for six months. Good luck. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You're listening to Combat Radio with Ethan Dettenmeyer right here on LA Talk Radio.